Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Julia share the secrets to simple stovetop macaroni and cheese. Dan reveals the science behind whiskey. Adam reveals his top pick for large saucepans. Lisa tests lid holders. And Becky makes Julia foolproof turkey meatloaf. It's all coming up on America's Test Kitchen. Julia and I have seen a lot of recipes for mac and cheese come through the test kitchen. So when a new technique crosses our path, we take notice. So we're here to show you how you can have a better mac and cheese through science. Mm -hmm. So there's a new mac and cheese on the block. <laughs> <laughs> it's a one pan wonder and it has four ingredients and it's good. Love anything with four ingredients. <laughs> yep, and it comes from the folks at Modernist Cuisine, who are very fancy out there on the West Coast, but it's really fast, it's really creamy, and so we were inspired to come up with our own one-pan mac and cheese recipe. I like that. Here's the one-pan, <laughs> medium-sized saucepan, and the trick is we're gonna cook the macaroni right in the beginnings of the sauce. Not only will the macaroni absorb some of that flavor, but the starch from the pasta will help thicken the sauce. That's such a good idea, because usually macaroni is boiled separately, and then it's added to the cheese sauce near the end. That's right, so here I'm gonna add the water. This is one and a half cups of water. I'm gonna add a cup of milk, and that's whole milk. And now we're gonna bring this to a boil over high heat because we're gonna cook our pasta right in that sauce. Okay. We're gonna add eight ounces of macaroni. Now, because we have a set amount of water, we want the consistency of the sauce to be just right, you have to weigh your macaroni. We want eight ounces of macaroni. This is our favorite macaroni. This is Gorilla brand elbows, and we like them because you can see they have little ridges, and those ridges trap the sauce. So, I'm starting to see bubbles. That is a good sign. So I'm gonna add the macaroni right to the pot. I'm gonna bring this up to a simmer, then turn the heat down to medium low, and cook that pasta through till it's just past al dente, which takes six to eight minutes. So this pasta has been cooking for about six minutes. You can see it's nice and tender. It's almost ready for the cheese which is one of the big ingredients in this recipe. We're putting cheese into mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we found after trying lots of cheeses is that the cheese you use in the mac and cheese makes a big difference in terms of the texture. So this is deli American cheese, and it is fabulous. It makes the best mac and cheese you can think of. Creamy, smooth, velvety, but it doesn't have a ton of flavor. So we're gonna balance our American cheese with a little bit of extra sharp cheddar. And between these two, you have a flavorful sauce and one that's good and creamy. So Right. So I'm just gonna grate this on the large holes of a grater because you really have to buy this stuff from the deli. Well, let me show you what you don't wanna get from the deli. Pre-wrapped slices of American cheese. Now they can vary widely. A lot of them have too much whey, which would cause our mac and cheese sauce to be too thick. Way and, too thick. Way <laughs> too thick. And some of them actually aren't dairy-based at all. They have vegetable oil as a main ingredient. So it really is a tricky process. You don't want to buy the wrong type of cheese, so always get the deli cheese and grate it yourself. All right, so this cheese is shredded. Time to check in on our pasta, and it cooks very quickly. And again, we're looking for a little past al dente. One for you, one for me. Sure. Mm, al dente approves. A little bit of cayenne for heat. A little bit of Dijon that makes everything cheesy taste a little more cheesy. <laughs> so that's half a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. And in goes the melty American cheese. And that's about a cup of American. We're gonna stir this in, and the heat's still on at this point, so that it just melts down into a nice creamy sauce. And this takes about a minute. So no separate cheese sauce, just mm. right in the same pot with the macaroni and the milk and the water that's reduced down. Oh yeah, that's coming together. Although we're gonna add the American cheese while it's still on the heat, to add the cheddar, I'm gonna take it off the heat and treat it a bit more gently so it doesn't break. Okay. So off the heat, I'm gonna add a cup of extra sharp shredded cheddar. We're just gonna stir it in. Just wanna get it evenly into the macaroni. All right, so it's nicely incorporated. I'm just gonna put the lid on the pot and we're gonna let the cheddar melt slowly. Okay. Meanwhile, what's mac and cheese without some breadcrumbs on top? I know, it's just noodles and sauce. <laughs> <laughs> An easy way to make a toasted breadcrumb topping is to use a third of a cup of panko and a tablespoon of olive oil. We're just gonna toast it in a little skillet right here on the stove top and you can just sprinkle it right over the portions of mac and cheese before serving. But this isn't necessary, it's an option, right? That's right, it's an option. Of course, you wanna season these breadcrumbs a little salt and pepper while you toast them. We're just gonna toast it in this skillet until they're nice and golden brown, and that just takes a few minutes, but you wanna keep your eye on them, because they have a tendency to go from very pale golden to burnt like that. Yes, they do. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about American cheese or pasteurized processed cheese. It's the key to getting the right consistency in this cheese sauce because it contains emulsifying salts. These salts make cheese melt smoothly by stabilizing the emulsion of the fat and protein. By adding American cheese to this recipe, we ensure that our cheese sauce won't break apart. All right, these crumbs are gorgeous. Beautiful. All right, to finish these crumbs off, we're just gonna add a little Parmesan, two tablespoons, kind of gilding the lily, I know, but it tastes so good. All right, we're gonna put this over on this side for serving. Sounds good. While you're not looking, I'm gonna taste it because it's kind of rude to eat in front of your guests before they're served. But I gotta see if it needs any salt or pepper. <laughs> it doesn't need any salt, but I think it could benefit from just a little pepper. Oh, that's yes. the kind of sound you need your mac and cheese to make. Ready to go. I'm gonna give you a big old bowl because, you know, it's mac and cheese. It is mac and cheese and I'm a kid. Now, a little breadcrumbs. Please. I mean, it looks incredibly cheesy, incredibly creamy, which is pretty amazing considering how few ingredients went into that pot. Oh, it's so good. It's just so creamy and it has a really clean, cheesy flavor. Clean is exactly right. You know, you didn't have to put a whole bunch of different spices into it. Really just that Dijon mustard is what I'm getting a little hint of, mm -hmm. but it's not overpowering at all. Well, you have proven that old dogs like us can learn a few new tricks. <laughs> <laughs> woof, <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> to make this very simple mac and cheese, boil macaroni with water and milk, then stir in American and cheddar cheese to make a super quick sauce. Top with crunchy panko crumbs, and there you have it. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, a new, improved, and silky smooth, simple stovetop mac and cheese. I'm gonna need a bigger bowl. Science is delicious. You've probably been using your whisk wrong since the first time you picked it up. Let me show you what I mean. Go. All four of these whiskers have the same amount of heavy cream in the exact same mixing bowl, and they're using the exact same whisks. The only difference, their whisking method. Joe here is using the side to side. Tim has a figure eight. Emily has perfected the loop. And Kate is using the stir. They're all going to whisk for exactly 30 seconds, and then we'll judge which method is the most effective. Whisks down, turn your bowls over. The clear winner, the side to side here. Why? Well, this whisking technique applies the most sheer force to whatever you're whisking. Shear force is when two forces are acting on something in opposite directions. In this case, the whisk pulls the cream in one direction and then cuts right back against it. That's shear force. When using the side to side method like Joe, whipped cream comes to peaks quicker, your vinaigrette gets emulsified better, and your egg whites foam up faster. A large saucepan is a core piece of equipment that we here at the Test Kitchen think every home cook should own. The price and quality can vary widely. So Adam's here to show us if we really need to shell out the big bucks for a great saucepan. You know, we have this lineup of 10 saucepans. They're all fairly large size, three to four quart. The price range was from about $19 to about $215. Mm. And we concentrated on core cooking tasks for the test. We sauteed onions, we steamed rice, we blanched green beans, we browned butter, and we made custard in all of these things. Okay. This one is made from anodized aluminum, which is an electromagnetic process that hardens and darkens the aluminum. This one sauteed a little too fast for us. When we are sauteing onions, we want a nice slow to moderate mm -hmm. cooking pace so that they brown evenly. Right. And if you get distracted for a second, you walk away, you answer the phone, you don't burn something. We did abuse testing as well. We did some thermal shock testing where we heated up these pans and then plunged them into ice water to mm -hmm. check for warping. And we took them out back and bashed them against a concrete <laughs> ledge three times. Our neighbors were so happy. Oh man, were they. <laughs> some of them survived better than others. This one, Not I don't so know much. if you can see, didn't survive that well. Also, we got a loose handle on this. So we got dense scratches and a loose handle. Not good. Not good. Let's talk about this one now. 
This one has a construction called disc base, which means that just the base of the pan, just the underneath, is a sandwich of three metals. It's aluminum in the center with stainless steel on the outside and the inside. But the walls of the pan are just stainless steel. And what testers encountered with this is that right where the disc base and the thin stainless steel walls of the pan met, they would get some burning, custard overcooked, mm. onions overbrowned. They also found that because of the curved sides, a little harder to see in there and see what was going on with your browned butter. Okay. That can go from a beautiful hazelnut color and a nice nutty flavor to burnt and bitter really mm -hmm. quickly. You have to keep an eye on it, especially towards the end of cooking, which was hard to do in this one because of the curved sides. It was hard to do in those two because of the dark interior. The rest of the pens in the lineup were all fully clad. And that means that those three layers of metal on the bottom of this one run across the bottom and up the sides. The entire body of the pan is bonded three or more sometimes layers of metal. Okay. These pans tend to be a little more expensive, but that construction is really designed to heat evenly reasonably quickly, and we like it a lot. Mm -hmm. But we did have problems with some of these guys. They can get really heavy. So Bridget, why don't you pick that one up and tell me what you think? It is a two-handed operation here. <laughs> really heavy. That pan is four pounds, 12 ounces, empty. Really hard to hold up when you're pouring from it. There is nothing in there, you're right. <laughs> And when you are holding it up to pour from it steadily, or holding it with one hand and scraping something out with a spatula, that's a lot of weight to handle. It is a lot of weight, Definitely. yeah. Definitely. This guy had a problem because this handle, which is sort of comfortable, but mm -hmm. a little short, got really hot during cooking. Very close cooking. to the pan. Yeah. yeah. Didn't like that one so much. Then we get to this pen, which I know is gonna be familiar to you. Very much so. This is the all clad. This is a terrific pen. This is one testings before. We've used them in the test kitchen for almost two decades. Check out this handle. Very comfortable. It's got that cupped shape that kind of anchors it right. in your hand. Right. It didn't get too hot. It feels like holding a good tennis racket. Exactly. <laughs> and so this is our winning saucepan, Bridget. This is the all-clad stainless four-quart saucepan. Not a cheap pan. It's $179.13. So we actually named a Best Buy, which okay. has also won previous testings. This Cuisinart multi-clad unlimited four-quart saucepan with cover, $65.12 for this one. But you know what? Its performance was pretty Pretty good, and for that kind of price difference, we're happy to recommend this one as well. Well, there you go. Our winner is the All Clad Stainless Four Quart Saucepan, and the price is one seventy nine and thirteen cents. We develop hundreds of recipes here in the test kitchen, but before any of them get published or put on TV, we send them out to a small group of home cooks for a trial run. These folks make the recipe, then fill out a survey with questions like, could you find the ingredients? Did you have the right equipment? Or did you make any substitutions? We learn a lot from these surveys, and it's made one thing very clear. Lots of folks like to swap ground turkey for the ground beef, and they're disappointed with the results. Take this turkey meatloaf, for example. This was a beef meatloaf. We just put in ground turkey, and it is a brick. I mean, is this a meatloaf or a Boston paver? And here, let's take a look on the inside. Oh, if I can barely get my knife through that. Oh, it's dense. I mean, and look at this. It just crumbles right apart, almost like whitefish salad. It's I mean, horrible. This is terrible. <laughs> we can do so much better. Oh, good. We tweak the recipe from top to bottom. You can't just swap in turkey and call it a day. They're different animals. Yes. Literally. They really are. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get going. We're going to make something much, much better. All right. I have three tablespoons of butter melting over low heat. Now we're adding butter because unlike pork or beef, turkey has very little fat. So we're going to add back some of that richness with the butter. That's right, because usually when you make meatloaf, you saute some aromatics, but it's just in a little bit of fat. This is substantially more fat in the pan. That's right. And I'm adding a little bit of baking soda, just a pinch. We're creating an alkaline environment that helps the onions break down a lot faster. I have half an onion. It's chopped up fine. Our onions are going to cook in only about five minutes, whereas they would take about 15 minutes. And a quarter teaspoon of salt. And we'll cook these for three or four minutes just until they start to soften and take on a little bit of brown color. All right. It's been about four minutes. You can see our onions are starting to get a little bit brown there. Mm -hmm. Nice and soft. Nice and soft in a quick amount of time. Because you don't want crunchy onions in a meatloaf. That's bad. No, you just want them to kind of fade away into the background, but give you that nice little flavor. Here's one garlic clove minced up. Classic stuff that goes in meatloaf. Teaspoon of fresh thyme. 
We want to cook that garlic down a little bit, let the flavor start to bloom. Smell it already? Mm, you can. Okay, so it's been a minute. Mm -hmm. That garlic's been very fragrant. Yes, so good. <laughs> and now I'm adding two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. Packs a punch in terms of flavor. That's right, it goes into beef meat loaves as well because mm -hmm. it is so full of flavor. Yeah, and actually Worcestershire sauce is mostly vinegar, but it has lots of other things in it like sugar, molasses, garlic, clove, anchovies, tamarind, and then it's aged for a few months before it's strained in bottles. And that's why it has such a punch. Yeah, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Yep. So we'll let this reduce down for a minute just to concentrate those yummy flavors. All right, that looks good and yeah. smells good. It smells potent. Mm. So let's put this in a bowl. We'll let this cool down for a few minutes, and then we'll come back and mix up our meatloaf. Our onion mixture is nice and cool. I'm going to add two egg yolks. That'll add some nice richness to the lean meat that we were talking about, and it'll also help to bind the meatloaf together. Now, two tablespoons of Dijon mustard. That's a lot of Dijon. It won't make the meatloaf too spicy because we're at two pounds of meat, so it'll be just the right amount. Mix that in. Okay, now I have my secret weapon for turkey meatloaf. <laughs> Three tablespoons of quick oats. Now this is very unusual. Right, now we wanted to kind of break up that dense texture that we saw in that horrible meatloaf. Yes. We tried everything. We tried bulgur, we tried ground nuts, we tried couscous. Turned out that quick oats were the very best. They break up that texture. You can't identify them as oats in the meatloaf, and they work really nicely. And they just cook right in the meatloaf. That's right. Now, if you can't find quick oats or you don't have them, you can use old-fashioned oats. You just want to chop them up really fine. Just don't use steel-cut oats. Okay. They'll stay kind of pebbly. They won't cook all the way through. I'm also adding two teaspoons of cornstarch. The cornstarch helps to trap all the nice juices that the turkey has, so it bakes up nice and moist. Also, three-quarter teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of pepper. Okay, so let's put our oat mixture in. The secret bowl of ingredients. <laughs> That's right, don't tell anyone. <laughs> now I have a third of a cup of chopped parsley. That's not so secret, but adds a nice little bit of color and flavor. Half a cup of Parmesan cheese. Now Parmesan has a ton of umami flavor, and turkey doesn't have a lot of that, so the Parmesan is gonna give us that nice savoriness that turkey lacks. That's a lot of flavor packed into that little bowl. It sure is, plus some texture from those oats. That's right. So now it's time for the turkey. It's turkey time. <laughs> so I have two pounds of 93 or 85% turkey, and I'm gonna use my hands to mix this together. There's no better tool. You just That's wanna right. get in there and have fun. So let me get going on that. When you go to the supermarket to buy ground turkey, you usually have two choices, a light-colored turkey and a dark-colored turkey. Now, the light-colored ground turkey is usually labeled 99% lean, and it's made almost entirely with turkey breasts. That means it has less fat, less flavor, and it cooks up to be very dry. Now, this darker-colored ground turkey is usually labeled either 85 or 93% lean, and it's our favorite because it's made with the thighs, the dark meat, so that it has a juicier texture and makes a better meatloaf. My hands are cleaned up. Let's make up a quick glaze to go on top of the meatloaf. Ooh, I love those sweet ketchupy glazes right on the top. I know, it's almost the best part. <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> well, let's do some medium heat here. I have a cup of ketchup, quarter cup of brown sugar, two and a half teaspoons of cider vinegar, just for a little bit of tartness, and fruitiness. You know, cider vinegar has that nice fruity flavor. And just a half teaspoon of hot sauce. Just a smidge. Just a tiny bit, just to, you know, give it that certain something. Okay, so we're gonna let this bubble away for five minutes. You keep an eye on it for me? You bet. All right, so I'm gonna shape this meatloaf. I have a little bowl of water here. I'm gonna wet my hands just so the meat doesn't stick too much to my Very hands. Very clever. We also have a wire rack here. We've lined it with aluminum foil. The foil will be for easy cleanup. The rack is just gonna promote even cooking. All right. Let's get this onto the aluminum foil. So no loaf pan here, just a nice freeform shape. Yep, we're going freeform today. We're going wild. <laughs> well, you get more surface area with a freeform shape. Yes. That means more area for the glaze. That's right. And everybody wants more glaze, at least I do when it comes to meatloaf, right? All right, so we're going for nine by five. How do you think I did? I think you nailed it. I think I did too. Let's just double check. It seems a little bit much to have a ruler out here, but if you take your time to make a perfectly shaped meatloaf, it's gonna cook evenly. Makes sense. Right? So it's been five minutes. You can see our glaze thickened up nicely here. That even smells like meatloaf to me. I know, right? <laughs> it's that distinctive glaze smell. It sure is. I'm going to brush half of it on the meatloaf now. I just have a pastry brush here. I'm just gonna do some painting. <laughs> and we wanna paint the sides too, not just the top, because we want that yummy glaze all around. This is another advantage of doing freeform, is that you get more glaze. 
So we're going to bake this in a 350 degree oven for 40 minutes. Then we'll take it out and add the rest of that glaze. Mmm, lacquer it on the top. Yeah, we want that first layer to set and dry so we can add even more glaze. Nice. And then we'll return it to the oven for another 35 to 40 minutes. All right, that is looking pretty good to me. I think that's about half. I'll get the oven door for you. Thank you. We're doing the upper middle rack here. 350 degrees for 40 minutes. All right. When you take the lid off a cooking pot, where can you put it down? It's gonna make a mess. It's gonna make everything wet. A lid holder promises to contain the drippy mess and save counter space. But do you really need one? We tested four priced from $12 to $80. Now, they're all heat resistant, and most of them have troughs to catch drips. But right away, a few of these were flops. This one didn't even actually want to hang on to lids. And the Starship Enterprise over here kind of hogs the counter, and it's 80 bucks. We wanted our lid holder to be secure and compact. Our winner held every lid we threw at it, from small to big, and even managed our ladles and spoons. It's called the Yamazaki Home Ladle and Lid Stand, and it's the only model that also works as a tablet or magazine stand while you cook. For just $18, this versatile little tool is a big help. Ooh, that's looking good. That looks awesome. All right. So let's take its temperature here. We want it to be 160 degrees. That looks like a proper meatloaf. It does, doesn't it? That looks so good. And we are right where we want it. Nailed it. Let's let this rest for 20 minutes, and then it'll be time to dig in. It's been 20 minutes. All right. Let's do it. Eating time. Oh, so good. Do you like the end piece? I do. I love the okay. end piece. <laughs> it's kind of a small piece, though, right? Maybe you want one more. I'll never turn it down. <laughs> You can see right away that this is a very different meatloaf than the one we saw at the beginning that was like a brick. Oh yeah. This is light, has a much easier texture. The fork actually goes through it. It's gonna be nice and juicy. Mmm. Mm. I love the glaze too. Oh. Little sweetness, little tartness. Mm -hmm. Nice and sticky, it's really good. You know, this isn't just a great turkey meatloaf. This is just a great meatloaf. You'd actually never know that it was made with turkey. Mm -hmm. It's true. For the ultimate turkey meatloaf, start with sauteed onions and flavor them with Worcestershire and Parmesan. Add quick oats for texture and be sure to use dark ground turkey. Brush twice with glaze and bake the loaf on a foil lined wire rack. And there you have it. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, turkey meatloaf with ketchup brown sugar glaze. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from the season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastaskkitchen.com. So good. Oh, I love it. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.